Hello, everyone. Welcome. Um, I am Rocio, Research and Evaluation Associate. I am joined today by my colleague, Laura Viselli, also Research and Evaluation Associate, and our inspiring director, Salima Soliman, uh, from Research, Evaluation, and Foresight Squad at eCampus Ontario. And we're also joined by our spectacular interns, Emily Rowe and Medina Siddiqui from the Strategic Foresight and Innovation Program at OCAD University. Uh, we're very happy to be here with you today. And thank you for joining the session of TESS 2041 Hybrid Features for Tomorrow's Learners. So today we will be talking about uh, intersectional wellness counselors, uh, best practices and personal advisory boards. So since the COVID-19 pandemic hit a decade ago, um, the combination of higher volatility, uncertainty, ambiguity, and complexity uh, paired with the exponential innovation and changes happening in every aspect of living, learning, and working uh, made the model of lifelong learning truly gain a lot of traction. So people started entering the post-secondary education ecosystem uh, to form so, so, some sort of flexible lifetime partnerships with institutions to navigate their learning journeys at different life stages and phases. Um, so to ensure resonance with the changing needs of both society, the workplace, and individual learners and communities, personal advisory boards began to appear, if you recall. Uh, so if you remember in the beginning, they were formed by an academic inspiry, inspirer, an industry professional, a close confidant, and a learner mentor that each of the learners selected to guide them and have them a support to their journey. And then we realized that uh, an intersectional wellness counselor was also essential as part of those personal advisory boards. So today we'll have a few of them join us to tell us about their best practices. We are also going to be talking about ubiquity fluency and the latest wraparound supports that have been designed in Ontario for that. So if you recall, and especially as uh, a decade ago with the pandemic, we felt the lack of connection and immersion uh, in, in communities and spaces with the rise of immersive technology, such as uh, extended reality, virtual reality, and diminished reality, the concept of hybrid education truly evolved as the boundaries of the physical world and the digital world became even more blurry. This paired with increased mobility and the struggles and challenges that we've been having uh, of climate emergency refugees and people having to migrate to different places, ubiquity has become, as we know, um, the backbone of a resilient and anti-fragile post-secondary education ecosystem. So today we're going to be talking about the latest wraparound supports that have been designed to help educators, staff, and learners develop the skills to truly teach and learn from anywhere at any time. And then at last, in this session, we're also going to be talking about AI learning pathway mappers. So during this last decade, we've seen an incredible uh, evolution of machine learning and artificial intelligence. And paired with the fact that a decade ago, like a more rapidly evolving wor work context required constant reskilling and upskilling. And the fact that back then during the pandemic, the kids that were in, in online kindergarten are now uh, graduating, 65% uh, are now graduating into jobs that have only existed in this last decade. Uh, we've been relying on machine learning and AI learning pathway mappers as some sort of GPS for to help learners map their work plus learn pathways, uh, supporting individuals from career and learning paths exploration to rescaling needs to job placements, for example. So today we're gonna be talking about the new framework that has been developed by the Sustained Equity, Diversity, Decolonization and Inclusion Committee uh, to ensure that this, the programming, the algorithms and also the use of these systems is continually equitable, decolonized, inclusive and accessible. So thank you for joining us for this conversation. Um, I actually do know that we are in test 2021, not test 2041. And probably you were just like, Rocio, that was a weird mind trip you just took. What are you talking about? This is ridiculous. 
or probably you were thinking like, okay, this is too far out, but I kind of can see how we can get there. Maybe these are actually valuable ideas that we could or should explore, or we should be having more conversations about these topics because they kind of make sense. So this is kind of what the question that we have in mind uh, at eCampus Ontario, and we have begun this strategic foresight endeavor, which is a research driven evidence informed systematic exploration of possible features. And we're interested in this future focused conversations that we can have. So to do that, we do uh, we 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 use this framework of strategic foresight, and we're questioning what is changing today, what possibilities, even those preposterous possibilities, can be enabled by those changes. Um, what does that mean for post-secondary institutions? How do we need to be talking about these topics and iterating on them? And how do we make sense of complexity and uncertainty? And we're trying to use this with a strategic vision. The idea to, uh, about having this future-focused conversations is to really ask us, um, how can we build solutions for today's challenges while articulating visions for desirable futures? The idea here is that um, as a result of the chain of consequences and disruptions from the COVID-19 pandemic and the huge shift that we have lived in the post-secondary education ecosystem, there are so many lessons and innovations happening that we need to make sure that these changes that we're working on today uh, are also laying in strong, uh, a strong and sustained foundation that enable inclusive and desirable features for everyone. So as a starting point, we have been working on a series of foresight reports. A few of you might have read them already. And these are meant to be a map of exploration of uh, high level overviews of maturing trends in the context of post-secondary education. Uh, they're meant to be conversation starters and hints for further research and synthesis. So today we're gonna be talking about them and especially the one that puts the learner at the center, which is the, the purpose of everything. So behind those reports is this incredible team of interns uh, from the Strategic Foresight and Innovation Program at OCAD University, Emily Rowe, Medina Siddiqui, Nicole Bukir, um, and some of the members of the Rev Squad here at ETH Campus Ontario, yours truly, Rocio, Laura Viselli, and our director, Salima Solomon. So I will now pass the virtual torch to my colleague, Laura, so that she can start taking us through the reports. Wonderful, thank you, Rocio. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. Um, in our first report that Rocio mentioned and that Medina put a link to in the chat, in the first report titled The Hybrid Futures, we explored how to build a hybrid campus that utilized educational technology to enhance teaching and learning and wraparound learner supports. Through a process of iterative adaptation and innovation, a vibrant hybrid campus is not only possible, but a necessity as we emerge into these new futures. A hybrid campus can harness the best of both worlds, in-person and virtual learning and supports. And importantly, a hybrid campus can meet varying learner needs and backgrounds while leveraging the flexibility of ed tech. Next slide, please, Rocio. A successful, a successful transformation to an inclusive hybrid campus is facilitated by affirming a sense of belonging, community, and identity among community members. Intentional initiatives emphasize learner agency and engage learners as co-creators and partners in initiatives across all levels of the education experience. An intersectional approach explores how identity shapes a learner's educational, cultural, economic, social, and lived experiences. Great. Um, so when we were designing this, uh, this report about tomorrow's learners, uh, we came across a, a quote that really inspired all of us. Futures for all cannot be imagined by a few. And that's by Pupil Bisht, who's a futurist. And I'm not going to lie, my team fangirls quite a bit over her. She's pretty great. Um, she, uh, she's a really inspirational speaker and, and gave us some really grounding things for us to focus on as we develop this report. And so at eCampus Ontario, we love human-centered design. So when we're designing, 
for inclusion, we use a human-centered approach, but this report made us all pause and go, which humans are we centering? And how do we create space and embrace uh, the intersectionality, the complexity and the fluidity of identity as we design these futures? Um, one of my favorite things I've learned from this team is that there's not one future. And so you probably have, some ears have probably perked during this uh, with Rocio and Laura and I, and we say futures plural in that we accept there are multiple futures and we are planning for plausible futures. And as we plan for those, how do we plan for inclusion? And one of those methods is human-centered design, but being cognizant of, of how do we center around such diverse humans. Uh, also, when we're designing these futures, we need to design from inclusion. So that means a participatory approach. So the people that these futures are for should be at the table where we're designing them. The users of a system should be at the at the design stages of that future system that we're creating. And finally, we want to design with sustainable inclusion in mind. And that means that we identify patterns of change and we ensure we're designing for possibilities for diverse people and circumstances. So it's really having that eye to what are all the plausible futures given what we know about intersectionality and diverse uh, identities. Um, Next slide, thank you. Uh, one of uh, my favorite things about this report is that we had the opportunity and the privilege to feature artwork by a student. Uh, so this is uh, an art piece designed by Medea Hassan. It's called Formations. Uh, she is a PhD student in the Department of Social Justice Education at the University of Toronto, Ontario Institute for Studies in Education. She identifies as an Afghan uh, Canadian and a settler. And when she submitted this artwork to us, she wrote us a beautiful um, explanation about why she was submitting this to illustrate intersectionality in the post-secondary context. And I'd love to read a quote for you right now. She says, post-secondary education environments should be like the ocean, fluid and dynamically responsive to diverse communities of students within the system while bringing waves of structural positive change. And so that's what that quote and the artwork moved us to feature this as a way of knowing about intersectionality. Um, I'm going to pass it back to Laura here. Thank you. It was really important for our work, both in our reports as a unit, as an organization in the sector, uh, to explore commonly used terms and create a shared vocabulary. And having the shared vocabulary really allows us to communicate effectively about complex concepts in the context of virtual and in-person learning. So the matrix you see on our screen is, is a capture from our report, and it outlines the difference between diversity and inclusion and why striving for high levels are both, of both are critical to a thriving institution. Diversity is about the individual, the variety of unique dimensions and qualities and characteristics that we all possess. And inclusion is about the collective, creating a culture that strives for equity and embraces and respects and values differences. So on page seven of the Tomorrow's Learners Report, you can find our, our exploration of commonly used terms. The matrix is there, as well as definitions of equality, equity, accessibility, justice, decolonization, indigenization, anti-racism and racism. We encourage everyone to read and explore the, the, that page of terms. I'm particularly moved to and, and implored to get everyone to go to that page uh, following today's keynote as well. Great, so in this report, we, we, we started our conversations around intersectionality and I, I want to um, define intersectionality here for all of us. And it means that identities are complex. And, and different aspects or characteristics of identity overlap and interact to shape a person's lived experience, their educational experience, their cultural experience, their economic, their social experience. So who they are and how they self-identify interacts in complex ways uh, to impact their lived experience. Um, intersectionality came out in 19, uh, was coined uh, by Kimberly Crenshaw in 1989. Um, and I, I think it's important to note where the, the terminology came from. And it's related to, in the American court system, uh, there was a question of how do we um, uh, treat Black women and how do we understand the lived experience of Black women in the American uh, justice system? And there was, they are not 
just women and they are not just black. They are black women and they have uh, unique challenges and specific challenges that they face as a group. Um, so in, in our report, we created an identity wheel and we were inspired by identity wheels because it, it helps us understand that all of us have an intersectional identity. We all have complex identities and how we identify. And we center the individual and how the individual identifies themselves. Um, around the individual, we place the 12 protected grounds in the Ontario Human Rights Code. Um, uh, we thought it was important to ground it in our context. Um, and then on the outer ring, we showed how identity can manifest and the multidimensionality of identity. And so your identity, as you reflect upon your age uh, and your ethnic origin and your citizenship, um, how does that manifest in how you live and how you move through this world? Um, we also are very aware of the fact that identities are evolving and this is not a comprehensive wheel and we never, we don't intend it to be. We encourage um, folks to explore what does identity mean to you and what parts of your identity interact in different ways. Um, we have a quote uh, in, the, in the report that I'd like to share as well. Um, identity should be seen as a nexus, and I love that word, nexus, of multiple subjective roles, positions, and knowledges, along with a combination of students' individual traits, interests, goals, and abilities. And that was said by Vander Tavers, um, and we share that quote in our report. Um, next slide, please. In our report, we also tried to share some of the unique identities of learners. Now, we um, had really rich conversations around how to do this uh, respectfully and understand the lived experiences of those learners who we wish to share um, their lived experience with. So we encourage you to seek out learner groups, seek out student groups, and, and ask students um, in safe spaces uh, to learn from their experiences. Um, one thing I want to flag here is the evolving space of labels. Um, so we, we created a puzzle uh, to show how identities fit together and how they uh, take up space together. Um, but we had many rich discussions about how do we label these puzzle pieces. And I think it's something worth reflecting on here. Um, we wanted to show, for example, an international student may also uh, be linguistically diverse. They may be an English language learner, but not all English language learners are international students. Uh, we have a great Francophone community with uh, diverse linguistic abilities. And how do we create and co-create inclusive uh, learning environments for them? But we wanted to highlight how those things interact, but we also needed to put labels on this puzzle. Um, so that's why there are labels, but we recognize and understand the limitations of putting those labels on there. There are two acronyms on this puzzle that I wanted to address, uh, 2SLGBTQ+. Um, again, it, it's an evolving space in this acronym and we are learning um, and we are listening. And I think the big important part of this is asking people how they wish to be identified. Um, I think it's about taking a step back and not looking for the perfect label, but asking people um, to, to, to help us learn with them about their identity. Um, and the other one we have on here is BIPOC, uh, Black Indigenous People of Color. Um, and we recognize the limitations of, of this acronym. It, it emerges from the United States of America. Um, there's been some conversations about uh, putting the I first, so I BIPOC in the Canadian context. Um, and there's also dialogue about uh, not having this acronym be an accurate representation of the nationhood or Indigenous sovereignty. Um, so there is lots of conversations happening. And I think our big takeaway was to read, to listen, to learn, um, and to grow in these spaces. Um, as we all know, language is incredibly fallible. Um, and we are constantly trying as as humans to put labels on things, but sometimes there isn't a good label. And I think it's important that we recognize and enjoy it and, and, and take the time to learn to create those labels and spaces. Oh, and I have one more thing I wanted to say on this. 
there's also emerging, I love languages, I'm sure uh, everyone knows this. I, I could talk about this forever, but there is some, there's movement in this space where people are reclaiming terms. So as languages evolve and we learn and people say what they like to be called, sometimes terms that um, were negative in the past are being reclaimed by groups. And I think it's important that, again, we ask people how they wish to be identified. Um, so learners with disabilities, some people like being identified as having a disability, or some people are reclaiming the term queer. And so it's about asking people how they wish to be identified. Okay, I think that's, that's all I had to say on that. I will pass it on to Rocio, thank you. Thank you, Salima. So with this overview that Salima just gave us, we realize that when we talk about hybrid features for tomorrow's learners, that part of tomorrow's learners is very complex and also very fluid. Identities can also be changing at different uh, life phases and stages that learners might be at. Uh, so how do we ensure that we build hybrid features that are truly resonant with that great diversity, fluidity, and complexity of learners. Um, so we really encourage here to explore uh, what institutions are doing in terms of uh, learner involvement to design this, this hybrid campus experiences. Uh, because using intentional strategies to enable inclusive dialogues and practices and co-creating methods uh, can increase motivation and build a sense of community, both in person and virtually. So the snapshot that we that you see here on the slide from the report talks about uh, three different levels at which we could engage learners. We can talk about learner engagement, uh, which it refers to a broad range of activities that in, help us increase learner interest and motivation and making sure that we're understanding their needs uh, and meeting them through surveys and questionnaires, for example. We could also in lear uh, engage learners as co-creators uh, through meaningful collaboration, uh, empowering learners to be more active throughout the, the learning experience design process, or we could truly engage learner uh, learners as partners by doing this deep level um, involvement and agency of the learner and shaping this truly and fully collaborative and recipro reciprocal process um, that allows for equal contribution of educators, uh, experts, other facilitators, and the learners. Uh, so it's interesting to explore what institutions are doing in the space. And with that idea, always keeping the learner at the center and considering that the learner should be involved in designing this uh, diverse uh, and, and inclusive hybrid campus experiences, I will uh, pass the torch again to Laura so that we can talk about what what can we do about this? Wonderful. So really meaningful and holistic initiatives across all levels of post-secondary institutions can ensure that learners and educators and staff have a sense of belonging and safety and inclusion. Um, and in our report, we focus on initiatives that can take place at the individual level, person to person and across campus. So in the next few slides, we'll share initiatives individuals can take and then those that can happen across campus. Uh, next, at the first level, thank you, Rocio, for catching my next slide. Uh, at the first level are initiatives that can happen at an individual level. And we recommend that initiatives emphasize learner agency and engage learners as co-creators and partners in the post-secondary experience. Uh, as Rocio mentioned, this will ensure that initiatives are truly reflective of their intersectional identities uh, that are represented on campus. So individuals can do things like practice cultural humility by learning about one's own culture and biases. Uh, they can encourage self-reflection about their own relationship with oppression. They can explore the meaning of allyship and take meaningful action. And they could, they could practice empathy, which is, which is especially uh, important in the virtual environment. Um, in our report, next slide, please, Rocio. In our report, uh, we feature uh, the profile of Friday's keynote speaker, Coulter Asinoue. Uh, Coulter studied general arts and sciences at Sioux College and majored in history and minored in English at Algoma University. Uh, Coulter shares how his undergraduate experience helped him become the person that he is today. Uh, while at school, he had interactions with cultural advisors and elders who helped him discover and understand part of his identity as an urban indigenous person. 
Coulter now works as a staff member at both at both Algoma University and Shinwa Kinomagi Gameg. Um, in the report, Coulter shared his dream of a post-secondary education system that encompasses all indigenous voices in all areas of education. And he believes that the future of education nurtures and supports each learner's unique perspective while prioritizing land-based education. Now on to initiatives that can happen at the person to person level. So these include things like using mindful language and asking individuals how they would prefer to be identified, creating brave spaces through respectful engagement and engaging in formal and informal peer support or peer mentorship programs. And in our report, we feature a case study of just that, um, two indigenous peer mentorship programs led by the Office of Indigenous, Indigenous Initiatives at Nipissing University. These include the Peer-to-Peer -peer Indigenous Mentorship Program, which aims to connect learners at Nipissing with one another uh, through connecting learners with upper-year Indigenous learners. Another program is called the We Talk Dawin Indigenous Mentorship Initiatives. Now, this program connects Indigenous learners in university with Indigenous youth ages 13 through 17 who are enrolled in a local secondary school. Uh, these peer mentorship programs provide current and future uh, learners with an opportunity to build and strengthen their community. Great. We also uh, highlight some intentional initiatives we can do at the level of teaching, learning, and assessment. And so uh, these can be things like providing access uh, to supports for success. So anything from sign language interpretation to uh, allowing service animals uh, into the community. Um, we also think about ed tech and we're talking about these hybrid futures and how do we ensure uh, equity in, in educational technology and being aware of the inequities of technologies. So it's not just about making sure that students have the hardware and the software and the network they need. Um, it goes beyond that to making sure that we are aware of the biases inherent in educational technology. Um, after all, technology is designed by humans and it can perpetuate the biases of uh, humans that are creating it. Um, there's lots of other examples, uh, work integrated learning, ensuring that there is accessible and equitable access to work integrated learning uh, to support career readiness and career success. Um, uh, at the teaching level, ensuring principles of universal design for learning, implementing competency-based assessment, and also ensuring that culturally appropriate values are embedded into the teaching and learning, um, especially as it pertains to traditional ways of knowing, teaching, and being. Um, next slide, please. We also talk about campus-wide intentional initiatives. And so uh, this morning we had a really great, or this, I guess it's the afternoon, uh, feels like the morning. Uh, the after This afternoon, we our keynote talked about safer spaces and brave spaces. And we talk about moving beyond safe spaces to brave spaces in this report. Um, and, and some of the principles of brave spaces are controversy with civility, uh, owning the difference between intention and impacts. And so even if someone comes into a space with good intentions, recognizing that they could have a negative impact on the listeners and the others in that space. Uh, challenge by choice, allowing people the flexibility to step in and step out as they wish. Um, ensuring respect and uh, no attacks are uh, in our team. And we're gonna talk about Brave Spaces later, but we have a really good principle that we keep coming back to, which is we challenge ideas and not people. And so it allows us to have really critical conversations about the work uh, without it becoming personal. Um, and some examples of, of creating brave and affirming spaces, um, it's about creating the space for dialogue, but it's also about just the physical environment. So gender neutral bathrooms, um, non-denominational denominational prayer spaces, all of those allow for those brave spaces. Um, another example of campus wide is, um, and equitable hiring practices. Again, it was highlighted in our keynote this morning. Um, and uh, Ryerson University or X University as they're transitioning uh, their name, they have a quote that we shared, um, students are best served by faculty and staff who reflect their diversity. And I think that's really powerful is that students need to see themselves in the faculty and staff um, across the campus. And the final thing we talk about, well, we talk about lots of other things, but the last thing I want to highlight here is intersectional programming that is rooted in culture and tradition. And we highlight Centennial College's Pride Month. Um, and I like that it, Centennial College uh, root, 
when we say rooted in culture and tradition, pride began as a protest. And what I loved about when we, we learned about Centennial College's Pride Month is that they held critical conversations throughout the week, the month. And, and they had, for example, a conversation about queer experiences and health. And I think it's really important that pride is a celebration, but pride also originated as a protest. And I think it's important that campus-wide initiatives um, stay true to culture and tradition and allow for a critical dialogue across the campus. Um, that brings us to the end of our presentation piece. Before we, we are going to try breakout rooms um, uh, after this, uh, but I just wanted to pause here and ask if anybody has any questions or would like to engage uh, with the team before we move to breakout rooms. You can use the chat. Uh, I think uh, you might be able to come off camera. Is that true or unmute? Don't we're in it? We're um, do we need to leave the web version of Zoom to get into the breakout rooms? Um, I don't believe so. I believe we will automatically break out of here. I am not seeing any questions come through. I'm sure once we get into the breakout rooms, there will be a rich conversation in a smaller space. Um, I'm going to count to 10 because I'm an impatient person and I need to learn to count to 10 more often um, to give you give the folks a chance to ask any questions they may have. We will also be coming back after the breakout rooms in case anyone thinks of a question later on. Um, so I believe we have one. Okay, uh, our, our wonderful hosting staff say that you may stay on feed loop to engage in the breakout rooms if you're currently on feed loop. So if you're not in the Zoom room proper, Zoom room, uh, is that the way to say that? Anyway, uh, if you're uh, hanging out in feed loop, you can also uh, join the breakout rooms. So um, speaking of brave spaces, uh, you are all now honorary members of our research evaluation and foresight squad. And so we call ourselves the REF squad. Um, we as a team have defined these as our principles of brave spaces. And so we welcome you into our brave space. It is our intention to create the space for you all today as we explore these conversations. Um, our principles are we are intersectional people first and so humans first. Um, we believe we are all learners and educators and so there's always something new to learn but you all, all have something to share and we all can learn from each other. Um, as I mentioned before, one of our principles is that we challenge ideas and not people and we as a group live in a world of multiples. We believe there are multiple truths, there are multiple realities, and there are multiple futures. And we encourage you uh, to think in that multiple, um, multiple way as we move forward. Uh, so I will pass it off to Rocio to explain the activity and then we'll break out. Thank you, Salima. Um, yes, so in a couple of minutes now, we will break out into breakout rooms. Each of you will be in a room with one of uh, the facilitators, which are Salima, Laura, myself, and uh, Emily and Medina. A couple of our interns who worked on uh, the authorship of this, this report. So the idea is to have a, a conversation a, around these topics that we just shared with you. What does that mean for you in your particular role? What does that mean for your institutions? What else should we be talking about? What ideas do you have? What other questions do we need to be asking? Uh, so you will be able to vote on which of the general topics that we covered today uh, you're more interested in discussing more deeply, whether it is the diverse learner experiences, which include the identity wheel and the examples of international uh, intersectional learner identities and lived experience, the puzzle, if you remember it, um, or we're interested in talking more about intentional initiatives. What can we do from the teaching, learning, and assessment perspective, from indi as individuals or as person to person, uh, to build hybrid, inclusive hybrid campus? Or do we are we interested in diving deeper into inclusive hybrid campus communities? So talking more about what can we do from campus-wide communities? 
So if, if our wonderful team from Redstone Agency can now help us go into the rooms, we will go. Uh, you will be able to vote for your topic of preference in there, and then your facilitator will guide you uh, using Miro board. Uh, so you will see in the screen uh, sticky notes ready for you to click and drag to make your comments uh, and also double click on them to write on them. They will be guiding you section by section so that you don't uh, get lost and everything will be ready for you in there. So I understand it might take a couple of minutes for us to be transferred to the breakout room. So patience. What was this awkward moment? Uh, Rocio, when are we coming back to this room? Oh yes, we're coming back 4.45 uh, to this room uh, in case you wanna join us uh, for some closing questions that you might have that you would wanna share with, with everyone or with all of the facilitators and for some closing, uh, closing notes. So 4.45, we will be coming back to this room. Sounds great, thanks, perfect. Hello. I think folks are still joining us back. Uh, we'll just hang out for a little bit longer here. Yep. Hey, Laura, it's good to see you today. Oh, I can't hear you. I think you're muted. Okay, amazing. I think we're all back. So um, we've lost a few folks, but um, we're looking forward. We have a few minutes here if anyone would like to surface anything that came up in their conversations in the breakout rooms, uh, anything you'd like to ask of the panel while we're here. Oh, thanks, Lindsay. Well, maybe some questions come. Oh, Laura. Has oh, yeah. Coming. We were warned. We were warned that we were going to lose some folks when we went to breakout rooms, but we thought it was valuable to create some smaller safe spaces for folks to engage with the content. And to those who found some time when they left the breakout room, I hope they are having a great afternoon. Yeah. And I just wanted to highlight uh, a comment that was made in, in, in my breakout room, which I think is really important when we talk about co-creating the hybrid campus experience um, and this learner engagement models that we uh, shared, for example, uh, we need to remember that it should be by choice uh, so that uh, learners especially still have a choice of how they engage. Uh, like we can motivate like as much engagement as we can an agency in co-creating the hybrid campus experience, but that are, that's, we should ensure that that is, remains a choice also for learners. And that if they choose not to participate in co-creating, that also doesn't hurt or hinder their learning experience. So just remembering that also like choice by design perspective, I thought was an interesting conversation that we had. Thanks, Rocio. In, uh, in my room, we talked a bit about whose voice and how do we, how do we listen and who speaks and who is spoken for and how do we avoid tokenism in that space? And I think um, we had a really great keynote this afternoon who spoke about, uh, it's about consistency. It's about consistency over time in those, in those spaces. Um, but really we, ta we talked about the challenge of tokenism in a space where there isn't a, a diverse voice, there isn't diverse voices in a space and how do we start? How do we move forward? Um, anyone else wanna share some insights from their room? Laura? There you go. Um, oh, we were talking a lot about um, lifelong well we we got off track we came back um we were talking a lot about lifelong learning and what does that mean um recognizing that lifelong learning doesn't just start at the post after post-secondary or it doesn't just start after high school and how can we build systems of of lifelong learning and opportunities for lifelong learning i should say um that really take that into account 
we also talked a lot about how we can kind of, um, what's the word, what are we looking for? How we can recognize that the work that we're doing in Ontario or even in Canada is replicated in other parts of the world. And how can we reconcile, maybe that's the word I'm looking for, uh, to make sure that all this, this great work when it comes to everything we talked about today isn't duplicated. And, and you know, how can we collectively bring everyone together um, and it's a big feat. So we didn't we didn't have any answers, but uh, we had a great conversation. Yeah. I think in this space, it's okay that we don't have answers. Mm -hmm. I think it's a it's about the conversation. Um, Laura says we, Laura K says we talked about UDL as well and the importance of multiple means of engagement. I agree completely. Is um, creating different pathways for learning and allowing students um, choice and autonomy in that learning space, I think is really powerful. Oh, Lindsay, yes, please. Hi, everyone. Yeah, I was just going to add on to, to Laura's comment there. I think uh, as well, another important consideration um, is, you know, how do we position our content for lifelong learning, right? So what I mean by that is, you know, being really intentional with how we frame the content that we are delivering in a way that is sort of for maximum reach and impact. And that can be like a, a tough consideration. I remember when I taught geography labs at Laurier, um, uh, we had, uh, you know, a number of, um, you know, adult learners, mature students, uh, however we want to um, label them or if we want to label them lifelong learners, <laughs> but that weren't in that sort of traditional sort of age range of, you know, 19 to 20, 21. Um, and I was really mindful of just even sort of the, um, the jokes that I might tell, right? Or just the, the ways that I would engage with the students. I just wanted to really create a, that, that inclusive learning environment in the, uh, in the labs. And so that was really, um, you know, I had to be really mindful and sort of intentional with that and ensure that I wasn't uh, just like you would for sort of any, you know, any sort of classroom, uh, but because we're talking about lifelong learners, just really uh, being cognizant of how we position that content for maximum delivery and for maximum impact. Thanks, Lindsay. Uh, Laura also added, the speaker today said 40% content, 60% relationships, but they expect us to cover so much content. So it's that that balancing act of competing priorities. And, and Lindsay, you uh, bringing up geography, you know, uh, we're also talking about content that was developed by a certain group, a privileged group, a privileged group drew the maps. Um, and there was a West Wing episode where they presented an upside down map of the world, well, an upside down map of the world. And there's no reason why North America is North. Um, it's just the way the maps were drawn. And so it's, it's an interesting space to get into where we talk about um, privilege in the content we teach and unpacking uh, the, the, the equity in just the content and what we teach um, is, a, is, an, is a deep dive and a heavy lift. Anything else we have? Uh, in the comments, in the chat, anyone else, Medina, Emily, anything you want to share about sure. your breakout rooms? Um, so we were talking about it, all these topics were huge, huge conversations and so many interesting came up and we were talking about um, what are some ethical implications um, in the topic that we chose. And um, we were talking about the model of a higher education, how it's currently built to be exclusive, that there is a gatekeeping nature to academia. And at the systemic level, what does that mean um, as we design intentional and meaningful initiatives for learners and everybody who's involved in this community? So I thought that was really, really interesting. Um, I can I can follow up with that. So um, our group talked a bit about uh, what does it mean to have an inclusive hybrid campus community, um, and you know when we are shaping these spaces, ensuring that certain groups are not left out in the process, um, specifically students with physical disabilities. And I thought it was a really important conversation to have, um, being really cognizant of the type of campus and the what does it mean to have an inclusive hybrid campus and thinking really critically around um, what does that mean and how can we do that and who needs to be involved in that space. Um, so my group had a really uh, wonderful conversation around that. 
Great. So we're almost at time. I'm not seeing any more uh, chats come through. So I might draw us to a close here. Um, we, I see people dropping off. So uh, to, to those of you who stuck with us till the very end, thank you so much for your time. And to those of you who dropped off, if you're watching a recording or something, we appreciate your time and your attendance today. Um, we really, um, we're passionate about these conversations. We love talking about them. I I feel like that might have come across just a little. Um, so please reach out to us. We uh, we love to have conversations and to engage. Um, our email address is research at ecampusontario.ca. Could someone throw that in the chat for me? Um, and yeah, we look forward to hearing from all of you. Uh, thank you so much for your time and your energy today. Um, uh, so this is the end of day two of tests. Um, I am to remind you that there is no test tomorrow. We're taking a wellness Wednesday, so enjoy your day. Um, and we will see you back on Thursday uh, for some, some more great conversations. Um, you will use the same logins as you have been using for the last couple of days. So everything should be ready for you on Thursday. So thank you so much, everyone. Have a great evening and we will talk soon.